This video is sponsored by Surfshark. Ever since Kathleen Kennedy was first announced as CEO of Lucasfilm, she started putting her mark on the company and its assets. This was most notable with Star Wars, which she changed into a platform for ideopolitical messaging. That was to be Kathleen Kennedy's legacy. But now, while she still is the figurehead of Lucasfilm, her legacy is in the process of being dismantled, one piece at a time. This process is spearheaded by Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni, who despite the best efforts of the Kennedy faction, are reshaping Star Wars back into the image of what George Lucas had always wanted, and they appear to be gaining ground. In this video, we will go through their recent moral victories and the backstories to them, as we explore how Mark Hamill himself appears to have chosen sides, and how Galaxy's Edge, the Disney theme park version of the sequel trilogy, may soon receive a Mandalorian makeover. The Kennedy faction hasn't given up yet though, and over the next couple of series, we will see programming from both the Kennedy and Favreau faction of Lucasfilm on Disney+. Streaming, more so than the big screen, will be the home of Star Wars going forwards. This isn't just true for Star Wars, but for Marvel with the soon-to-be-released WandaVision, DC with the already-released Wonder Woman 84 and soon-to-be-released Snyder Cut and pretty much everything else, which will go to a variety of streaming platforms. Historically, audiences merely had to wonder when their local distributor would get around to releasing the movie they were waiting for. Now they have to wonder if their preferred content is available at a streaming service that is available in their region at all, or if they're geo-blocked from watching it. Well, modern problems require modern solutions, and there are ways around such geo-blocking restrictions, for instance, by using a VPN, such as the one delivered by this channel's sponsor, Surfshark. A VPN, or Virtual Private Network, is a privacy protection tool which guarantees instant online safety and encrypts all data sent via the internet. On top of that, Surfshark allows you to bypass geo-blocking restrictions by changing the country you access the internet from, which also gives you access to 15 different Netflix libraries by simply changing your virtual location. Say that for some reason, you want to see what Star Trek Discovery is all about, but getting CBS All Access isn't an option. Well, by simply changing your location, you can access it from one of the international Netflix libraries, where you can also get the DC movies currently not on HBO Max. One of the advantages with Surfshark over many other VPN providers is that it allows one account to be used on unlimited devices. That's part of the reason why Surfshark is the VPN of our choice, and it gets even better. If you type in the code MIDNIGHT when ordering, that triggers an exclusive offer, which you now get 83% off the normal list price, plus three extra months for free. Surfshark also offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in trying it out. Do check our link in the description below for further details and to order. With that, let's explore how the Favreau faction of Lucasfilm appears to be gaining ground. Leading up to the release of The Last Jedi, one of the first people to warn the public that Ryan Johnson was taking the story in the wrong direction was Mark Hamill himself. I mean, it says right in the script, forget the past, kill it if you have to. <laughs> You're doing a pretty good job. I'm trying. <laughs> At the time, many assumed that Hamill must just be pretending, that he was merely playing the part of someone older who couldn't let go and make room for the next generation in some weird social statement part of the marketing campaign. In reality, Hamill was dead serious in his complaints. He recognized what Ryan Johnson had done as not just the deconstruction of Luke Skywalker, but the destruction of the Star Wars that George Lucas had created as a whole, and he felt so strongly about it that he simply wasn't able to conceal it, even if he was under contract to lie about how awesome The Last Jedi was. As it turned out, Hamill was right, of course. The Last Jedi did fulfill its on-screen promise of burying the past by killing it if you have to, all too well. But it failed miserably in giving audiences anything new to be excited about instead. The net result, therefore, was that it had, in some sense, killed Star Wars, as every indicator of the brand's commercial health flatlined in its wake. This in turn led to Bob Iger personally stepping in and taking control from Kathleen Kennedy, and reportedly handing a good chunk of it directly to Jon Favreau. That's how Lucasfilm became a company fractured between two factions. The Kathleen Kennedy faction of ideologues who want to change Star Wars into a platform for preaching identity politics and the Favreau faction that seeks to restore Star Wars to space fantasy of good versus evil it always was. In the Favreau faction's Mandalorian Season 2 finale, aptly titled The Rescue, the Luke Skywalker audiences wanted to see since 1983 made his triumphant return. He not only rescued Grogu, he rescued Star Wars, and fans were ecstatic about it and shared their emotional reactions to his surprise appearance on YouTube 
and other social media. Among the many who did so was Star Wars Theory, the single biggest Star Wars YouTuber and a cancer survivor whose reaction was taken from a live watch party. All this joy, of course, stuck in the craw of the Kennedy faction something fierce, prompting several of them to take immediate action so as to dampen the joy as much as possible. StarWars.com writer Brian Young appeared on the Slash Film podcast to discuss the final episode of The Mandalorian and to remind everyone not to get too excited because The Last Jedi still lay in the future for this Luke Skywalker. And so I think it's wholly consistent with The Last Jedi, but the sort of mind of the fandom menace sort, I don't think it's going to parse that nuance anyway. So they'll take it however they want. Many others also took pot shots at the audience for being too happy. And the first among them was Pablo Hidalgo, the Lucasfilm continuity guy who had no objections against force projections, force teleportation, or force healing. Hidalgo's mocking of cancer survivor Star Wars theory made the trades, which led him to issuing a forced non-apology, but not before highlighting the divide within Lucasfilm and making the audience who do pay attention to what is going on coalesce behind Jon Favreau and his second-in-command, Dave Filoni. Further emphasizing that was none other than Mark Hamill himself. On December 30th of 2020, Mark Hamill tweeted a picture of Luke Skywalker from his glorious return to form in the Mandalorian finale and captioned it with, Sometimes the greatest gifts are the most unexpected and something you never realized you wanted until it was given. He then added, Hashtag thank you John and Dave a reference to John Favreau and Dave Filoni, who made it happen. No thanks were given to Kathleen Kennedy. And to a certain extent, you know, it's not Luke's story anymore, but I, I think he's an important part of the overall arc of the saga. And again, there's a lot of mystery about him, even within the film. So you have to fill in your, your own backstory. I'm sure there'll be comic books and video games and novels that tell the story, but uh, I'm so. just going to break in here and make sure that everybody out there realizes he is so significantly important to the ne this next film. You have oh. no idea. On December 31st, whether intentional or not, Mark Hamill cast shade at Pablo Hidalgo in two back-to-back -back tweets sharing YouTube compilations of Luke Skywalker reactions, captioning them. Hashtag no words. Seeing fans' reactions to Luke's return is something I will cherish forever. Their anticipation seeing the X-Wing, Episode 6 robes, a lightsaber, a green lightsaber, a gloved hand, an ungloved hand, a force choke, R2, was overwhelming and very moving to me. I'm a fan myself, so I knew true fans would love it, but to see them thrilled beyond belief with the exuberance of children, whooping it up, screaming in ecstasy, the tears of sheer joy. It's a roller coaster of emotions I'll never forget. Hashtag I love UPFS. After which, Ming Na Wen shared how important it was to her to share that one scene with Luke Skywalker. Such is the importance of Luke Skywalker to Star Wars. And rumor has it, John Favreau and Dave Filoni are determined to redeem him and to make The Last Jedi but a long forgotten memory. We have shown this quote before, but it bears repeating because it highlights so well the schism at Lucasfilm. Disney Insider WDW Pro published on Pirates and Princesses that, with Disney in financial straits, they can no longer show their middle finger to fans and dictate what they must like. Luke Skywalker sells toys. He sells a lot of toys. Rey does not. The Mandalorian has been the only Star Wars franchise that has growing success over time. So what does Disney do? Disney puts Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian, and they're going to do it again. Here's where Disney is going with all of this. They need Luke Skywalker to be back, redeemed, and the Jedi Master fans want him to be. Toy manufacturers need Luke Skywalker back. Marketing needs Luke Skywalker back. Game developers need Luke back. The only people who don't need Luke back are the ideologically driven nutjobs who tried to fundamentally change Star Wars and the millennia-old concept of the hero's journey. According to more recent rumors, the Kennedy faction of, quote, ideologically driven nut jobs may be about to face another humiliating defeat. When Galaxy's Edge, the Star Wars land of Disney theme parks was originally conceived, it was meant to feature the likeness, world, and characters from the original trilogy. According to former Walt Disney World Resort Vice President Dan Cockerell, 
That changed when Kathleen Kennedy convinced Bob Iger that making it in the image of the sequel trilogy was the way to go. Cockrell told WDW Radio, Kathleen Kennedy, her point of view was, there are way more Disney Star Wars stories ahead of us than behind us. So we really should think about, do we want to build a Tatooine and build what all the 50-somethings remember Star Wars is? Or do we want to build something else which is going to appeal to all the upcoming generations who are going to know the new stories? And that day, Tatooine was killed at the studios, and all those concepts were put on a shelf. This turned out to be a bad decision, as contrary to what Kennedy convinced Iger, the sequel trilogy proved to be a creative dead end. And that brings us to the latest scoop from WDW Pro, published on Pirates and Princesses on December 31st. After reiterating how Favreau and Filoni report directly to Bob Iger and Bob Chapek for their MCU-inspired reinvigoration of Star Wars, while Kennedy has been sidelined into a corner managing the Acolyte and other spin-offs of little consequence, the famed Disney insider continued, Remember when Galaxy's Edge opened and attendance at Disneyland actually dropped? Don't thank the Phoenicians, thank Kathleen Kennedy, Epcot joke, sorry. She's the one who convinced Iger to jettison the original plans that would have gone with a more unified Star Wars land that would have meshed together with elements of the prequels, originals, and sequel trilogies. Well, guess what's happening at Hollywood Studios now in Galaxy's Edge? People don't want to see Rey. Rey who? They don't want to see Emo Ren that killed Han Solo. People want to see Mando. People want to see Ahsoka. People want to see Baby Yoda, Grogu. And people want to see Luke Skywalker. Disney wants money. So that's why I believe I can corroborate some rumors that have been floating around about changes to Galaxy's Edge. According to a source close to Walt Disney World management, Josh Damaro, we believe at the behest of Bob Iger, has started the process of determining costs and logistics for transitioning Galaxy's Edge in both Hollywood Studios and Disneyland to the timeline of The Mandalorian. Blue French cookies for everybody! In a January 3rd update, WDW Pro makes informed speculation that such a retrofit could happen and concludes, I think they'll divide the land into two areas. The rise of the Resistance area will be all about the sequel trilogy for now, while the market area with Smuggler's Run will be The Mandalorian. They'll talk about some time shift thing between the two areas in a press release, and they'll all sigh with relief that they can finally put popular Star Wars characters in the land. Knowing Kathleen Kennedy's Lucasfilm, they'll probably push to get Jar Jar in there with a bunch of porgs. Good thing then they're on the losing end of influence these days. We can't comment any further about the Galaxy's Edge retrofit, but the Kennedy faction losing influence is perfectly in line with the rumors that reach us. To reiterate those rumors, so keep that pinch of salt ready and treat it as rumor. The future of Star Wars is the very past The Last Jedi wanted to kill, while the sequel trilogy and everything it brought to the franchise is being buried. Favreau and Filoni are giving Star Wars an MCU-inspired makeover, with The Mandalorian serving a similar introductory role as Iron Man once did, leading up to Thrawn, while Kathleen Kennedy's projects are isolated passion projects that don't matter in the bigger scheme of things. The legacy of Kathleen Kennedy and her faction of Lucasfilm is in the process of being dismantled, one piece at a time. Let us know your thoughts on Kathleen Kennedy's reign and legacy being dismantled, and before you go, remember that to help bypass quarrelsome geo-blocking restrictions, you should get a Surfshark VPN. Use our code MIDNIGHT to get 83% off plus 3 extra months for free. The link is in the description.